Good morning. So, how's the weather? Just kidding. I just looked out the back window and I went, ugh. But it is uh, so good to be with you this morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's good to see you. Uh, if, if you don't know who I am, my name is Joshua. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And, uh, and it's Palm Sunday. Isn't the kids do a good job? Like, love it. Like, like, our hearts need more of that, right? Right? Worship from our kids, and it's just so encouraging to see them. Man, they're setting the example for us, so love that. Um, uh, yeah, so this is, this is what's called Holy Week, because Christians celebrate something called Holy Week. It's Palm Sunday starts what's called Holy Week, and of course it leads up to Easter next Sunday. Does anybody feel like it's really early this year? It's because it is early this year, just so you know. But next Sunday is Easter, and uh, we're going to celebrate uh, big time, you guys. Just a reminder, uh, man, be thinking about friends, family, neighbors that, that you can maybe invite to, to come and experience. Maybe they need a little hope. Maybe they need a little joy. And I, I guarantee you next Easter, next Sunday, is gonna be, it's going to be a celebration, you guys. Uh, of course, our services will be at 9 and 10.30 next Sunday. Uh, and not just Easter, but also just want to remind you, uh, Good Friday is this coming Friday. It's, it's a chance to gather, to remember Jesus' sacrifice, the, the, the going to the cross part, and the, the significance and the power of that. And so our Good Friday service is going to be at 6.30 on Friday. And of course, bring the family. It's okay. Bring the kids. It's okay. We know they're going to get squirrely. We're okay with that. Don't sweat it. And it'll be a chance to, to worship, to have communion together uh, as a family, right? And uh, it's going to be powerful. So just want to remind you of those opportunities. Hope you can join us for Good Friday and, of course, Easter Sunday next week. So, uh, well, if you've been around, you know that we've been working our way through uh, the book of Mark, right? And, and we're, we're, coming to the fi- we're coming to the close, and I think it's so cool. We're going to end on Easter Sunday, next Sunday, with the last chapter in Mark. But today, we're looking at something called the triumphal entry, right? Palm Sunday. And, and it, yeah, I hope you forgive me. In order to do that, we actually have to go back in time a little bit. We've gone past Mark chapter 11, but I'm going to go back to Mark chapter 11 because that's where the passage is, where Jesus enters Jerusalem. And uh, we're going to look at that today and the significance of that. But before I jump into that, uh, reminisce with me for just a moment. Uh, I remember when I was in grade school, and I don't remember what grade, probably second, third grade, I had this, this teacher introduce me and my classmates to the story of King Arthur, right? The legendary king of Britain and central figure in medieval literature tradition. And, and I remember reading her reading the story to us, and I was just captivated by this idea of this king that was good and humble, and he was sacrificial. He put his kingdom before himself. And still to this day, I'm just going to be honest, I find myself gravitating towards stories of kingdoms and kings. Like I, Even just a good... Uh, uh, um, book about a kingdom, it just kind of gra- it just grabs me. Now, whether we want to admit it or not, I, even though we live right in a modern day democracy with a president, I think we are still captivated by this idea of a king. I mean, think about history. How many stories have been made up and passed on from generation to generation about kingdoms and kings? There's countless stories. And if, 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 and if you don't believe me, okay, I have a statistic to prove it. Almost a year ago, on May 6th, 11 million Americans tuned in to watch what? The coronation of King Charles. Why? Because they're captivated. We're captivated by this idea. It's not even, that, I mean, those are our brothers and sisters across the pond. But we were captivated by this king idea. I think it's something in our hearts, you guys. I do. Now, there's this guy, I'm sure you have familiar. a lot of you will be familiar with the name C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis, he was a famous writer, scholar, theologian, and he once wrote that the universe itself is a constitutional monarchy. He said, the world of fairy tales makes the heart and the imagination royalist. He said, no fairy tale begins with once upon a time there was a president. You never hear that, Right? Fairy tales begin, once upon a time, there was a king. There's something in our hearts, in our imaginations, that default to this category. There just is. And I love Mark chapter 11 because we're going to see something of that dynamic here in this chapter. We're going to begin to see a new king 
showing us what kind of king he's going to be. And he's not the king of a particular nation or state or even a group of people. He's a king whose reign is going to have a bearing on the entire world, whose rule is going to touch, whether we realize it or not, every single one of us. And he's going to show us what his kingship is going to look like. So without any further ado, let's dive into Mark chapter 11. Now, if you brought your Bible with you, we're going to meet right at the front of Mark chapter 11. If you have a Bible app on your phone, that's great if you want to pull that out. No worries if you don't have it, it'll be up on the screen. Let's read Mark chapter 11. Here's what it says. As they, so this is Jesus and his followers, okay, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt uh, outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. Now here's the entry part. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus then entered Jerusalem and he went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now, again, there's something in my heart that resonates with this passage. And I think that people gravitate towards this idea of kingship precisely because we do live in a universe that is itself a constitutional monarchy. Guys, there is a king at the center of reality. And we see the arrival of this king now in Mark chapter 11. It's a really significant moment in the gospel. Jesus is now finally arriving in Jerusalem. Okay, this is the city above all other cities. This is a city who has been looking for a king for generations. That's their reputation. They have been waiting anxiously for the ultimate king of the universe. And as Jesus arrives, it looks like they're maybe finally going to get what they've been hoping for. They're cheering, they're, they're hailing him as a king, they're spreading their cloaks on the ground, they're putting down palm branches. These are all the things that you did culturally back then to, to recognize and greet someone like a king. This would be like the equivalent of us, right, rolling out the red carpet, right, having a marching band, waving those little flags, you know what I'm talking about? It's the same idea. But who shows up in this moment is a very different kind of king. This is not the royalty that we're used to. Now, we got to backpedal just a little bit. But back in Mark chapter 8, when Jesus started to identify himself as a king, uh, he, he's, he made it clear that I'm not going to be the king that you're, you're expecting. Okay? Do you know what he did? He started to talk about being a king, and then he started to talk about dying. That's really weird behavior for a king. Usually kings don't talk about that. But he did it three times. He talked about how he was going to die. In fact, he said he was talked about how he was going to die and rise again. This is strange behavior for a king. But this was how he was going to express his kingship, by dying. And then, if we fast forward two chapters to Mark chapter 10... Jesus begins to contrast what his kingship is going to look like compared to the rule of everybody else that we see in the world around us. And I want to show you this. This is really important for us to understand. Look at Mark chapter 10. Jesus called all of his followers. He said, listen, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in high positions act as tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you will be your servant. Jesus is saying, hey, take a look around. Look at the world around you. You know that I'm right. You can't miss this. The rulers of this world do what? They lord it over those that they lead. That's how the world works. 
People gain power and then they throw their weight around. But Jesus is saying, listen, this is not going to be the case with me, my kingship, and with you. We're going to be different. We're called to be different. And then, I love this, Jesus sums up his kingship in more detail in verse 45 of the same chapter. Look at what he says. I bet you've even heard this passage before. For even the Son of Man, that's a title that Jesus had for himself, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So in verse 45, Jesus says, listen, even the Son of Man, right, the one who God was going to give all authority, all power, this king riding into Jerusalem on a colt, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life. So Jesus is already, before we even get to chapter 11, showing us the kind of king that he's going to be. And it's super different than what the world is used to. And now, as we just read in chapter 11, Jesus goes public with his kingship. He's, let, he's putting it out there. I am a king. Now Mark, and I love this in this passage, he's going to highlight some of the ways that make Jesus different than the ruler's of the world. And I want to contrast that for us today so we understand just how powerful this is. So, so let me just share a couple of those with you today, okay? Well, first off, we notice in, in Mark 11 that we find in Jesus absolute control. Absolute control. Now, let's be honest. All rulers have some measure of power and control. Right? That's not a profound observation. But however much control they have, they never really have complete control. I mean, think of the craziest dictator, okay, that, that's got like so much power over his country, okay? They can set up all kinds of things the way they want. They can rig elections. They can have opponents removed. Think about it, right? But let's be honest, they can never actually have complete control because eventually they're going to find themselves removed as well. But with Jesus, it's different. He is in control of everything that is going on. And we see that in the opening verses of Mark 11. We see it actually in how Jesus instructs his disciples. Look at those verses again with me. Jesus said, go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you're doing this, say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. Guys, this is really, really specific. Jesus is not just saying, hey, guys, go find me a ride. Just Uber me something. That's not what he's saying. This is really, really specific. Go to that village, and there you will find a colt that no one's ridden. This is what's going to happen, and this is what you're going to do. And guess what? It all happens exactly as Jesus says. Verse 4, right? They went, they found the colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, just as predicted... Some people standing there asked, what are you doing? I'm telling you that quote. They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. Everything happens the way Jesus said it would. Now, okay, let's be honest. He might have gone there the day before and arranged all of this ahead of time, maybe. Perhaps he, this is a picture of Jesus' foreknowledge. There, we see times in the Gospels where Jesus like, knew things that nobody else would have been able to know. It could have been that too. Either way, the point is the same, okay? The point is, everything is happening as Jesus says. He is in control. We also see it maybe in the way that Jesus refers to himself. Did you notice that? That in verse 3, he says, listen, if anybody asks, what are you doing? Tell them what? The Lord needs it. And when Jesus uses this term in Mark's gospel, Jesus deliberately first to himself as Lord. It's a, lo it's a loaded phrase, you guys. He's associating himself with God. In chapter 2, he, he did it there too. He describes himself as Lord of the Sabbath. In chapter 5, when he heals this guy that's demon-possessed, he, he tells the guy that he healed, he says, go and let people know what the Lord has done for you. Same term. So when Jesus uses this term, he's implying divine authority. And that's what's happening here in Mark chapter 11. Again, the point is this. Everything is happening the way Jesus says it will. Why? Because Jesus is the Lord. We can't miss that. 
Jesus is going to be a king, you guys, who rules with divine power. And so we see he's in control. Now, why is this important? Well, the disciples need to know this. They need to know this because they're coming to Jerusalem, and guess what? In a matter of days, Jesus is going to be betrayed, abandoned, arrested, tortured, and brutally executed. And the disciples need to know that when those things happen, okay, it's not because everything is out of control. Jesus has not lost control of the plan. No. It means that even in those moments, Jesus is still in control. This is what he meant to happen. In fact, guess what? He predicted it. Why? Because he's in control. He's got the plan. And and let's be honest, right? We need to know this too, don't we? (laughs) I mean, look, look at the headlines that we see. They're always trending in unsettling directions. And it can be easy for us to think, right? Well, like, hey, are you asleep up there? Like, have you lost control? And so much of what is going on feels like it's beyond our control. And guess what? It is beyond our control. But it's not beyond his control. And perhaps maybe some of us need to hear that today. Now, on the other side of the, con- the coin, right, if we look at that Jesus is in control, if we flip the coin over, like, that's great that Jesus is in control, but it's only great if Jesus is good, which is why Mark doesn't just stop at showing us that Jesus is in control. He's going to show us next that the kingship of Jesus is going to be marked by another trait, his meekness. The king who is in control is actually meek. Now again, in our world, what, what do we see? Power leads to self-importance, right? The further someone advances up the ladder, the fuller of themselves they tend to become. The less likely they are to show genuine care for the little people. That, that's the way the world works. Jesus told us this in chapter 10. You know that those who are considered rulers lord it over others. It's what people do. You get power and you lord it over people. You show them you're the one who's in charge, you're the one who has the power. And what do we see happens? It breeds corruption, it breeds scandal, it breeds self-importance, it breeds entitlement. We see it all the time, right? Power and arrogance so often, they go, they go together in our world. But with Jesus... We see power, we see control mixed with meekness. Power and gentleness. Power and humility. I mean, Jesus has ultimate power, but he's not full of himself. And we see that in this passage, in the scene, right? In the scene that we just read, that's that's played out. This is a standard royal arrival into Jerusalem, okay? This is the way it's supposed to go. But one detail is dramatically different. You see, guys, a mighty ruler that was power, full of power, okay, they're, they're, um, Jesus is doing, uh, they would have arrived on a war horse. Honestly, Jesus doesn't show up on a war horse. A military leader would have showed up on a war horse or this magnificent chariot. Why? To show their, to show their grandeur, right? To show that they're superior, that they're, show, that they're in charge. Jesus comes on a colt. Okay, it's a tiny donkey, you guys. It's what the hobbits would have been riding on. Now remember, Jesus is in control. So guess what? If he would have wanted a war horse, he could have gotten a war horse. Jesus arranged for this to happen. He's trying to tell us something. He's trying to communicate something. He comes not on something that's this mighty beast, but on something that's small and meek in stature. The point is, Jesus is a different kind of king. He's not about his own grandiosity. He's about humility. He's meek. And Jesus, and I love this. This is so cool, you guys. Jesus is following the script that's been around for 500 years. And this is what God told us and promised was going to happen. You see, there's way, if we go way back in time to the Old Testament in the Bible, there's this book called Zechariah. And, And God tells us the, about the king that he's going to send in the future. Okay, so look at this in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. 
It says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Zion is in Jerusalem. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is what? What's it say? Humble. Riding on a donkey. Riding on a donkey's colt. 500 years ago, it was predicted. A king who is righteous, who will correct every wrong in this world, a king who can save us. And it goes on to say he's humble, mounted on a colt. That's what God has always promised because, you know what, you guys? It's what we've always needed. We don't need a king whose greatness is so far beyond reach that we can never reach him. You know, we need a king who can come down low to where we are. That's what we need. That's what I need. And that's what Jesus did. Now, listen, I I was thinking about this word meek, and and I want to be clear about something. Meekness does not mean weakness. I think sometimes we can, like, put those together. They are completely different. Guys, this does not mean that Jesus is a pushover or a weakling. He is far from it. Let me give you a picture. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a dork sometimes, you guys, so I enjoy watching these nature shows. You ever watch nature shows, you know, documentary, like Planet Earth? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, I got caught up watching one of these one time, and I was fascinated by this one episode that was about these, these crocodiles in East Africa. Huge animals, right? And I, and I was fascinated, and I watched. And so what happens is every year... Uh, there's this mass migration of what's called the wildebeest. You guys know what a wildebeest is? They're land animals. They're, he- they're, they're big. And every year they have this mass migration across the country. And these alligators sit in the river, in the Maro River, and wait for these wildebeests to cross through the river. And I, I mean, I hate to say it, but I'm sorry. It's like an all-you-can-eat buffet for crocodiles. It just really is. But I was fascinated by this. And these crocodiles are so powerful. They can grab one of these wildebeests. And wildebeests are not small, weak animals. They're 600 pounds, you guys, of muscle and flesh. And with just their jaws, these crocodiles can grab a wildebeest and drag it under the water. It even said their jaws are so powerful they could crush the wildebeest's skull with one bite. That's powerful. And in the same episode, as I was watching, it talked about how these crocodiles, when it comes time to lay their eggs, this is so crazy to me, that those same jaws that can take down a wildebeest can can reach over into its nest and and grab one of its eggs and, and turn it if it needs to be turned. It can even pick it up and move it to another location without so much as a crack or a puncture. That's amazing to me. And what's my point? My point is this. Gentleness is not the absence of strength. It is the application of strength to tenderness. That is what we actually see in Jesus. Jesus said of himself, guess what? A bruised reed he will not break, which is remarkable given all the things that Jesus can break. You guys, Jesus can take down kingdoms. But he won't crush you and I in our places of greatest tenderness. Think about that. We can trust our deepest wounds to him. We we can trust our most painful bruises to him. All that power, all that control that he has. And you know how he deploys it? He deploys it to care for us. That's Jesus. Now again, right, what did Jesus say in Mark 10, right? He said the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. All that strength that Jesus is going to use, all that power, what does he do? He uses it to serve others. And I think some of you, maybe this is what you need to hear, you guys, that Jesus, the King on high, believes that you are worthy of his service. This makes Jesus extraordinary in my book because, let's be honest, he's doing what no other person can do if we're honest about that. That's amazing. He's taking power and using it for the sake of serving others. The one who has all the power, you guys, all the control, 
All the authority is meek. Now, Mark doesn't stop there, of course. That, that control, that meekness, it means that there's a third characteristic of Jesus' kingship that is going to be inevitable, and we see it, and that is sacrifice. And we see this reflected all the time in the Gospels, how Jesus puts others first. He sacrifices himself. Of course, the ultimate sacrifice when we celebrate Good Friday, right? But we see it actually mentioned back in Zechariah again. Remember, that was, they were foretelling. We talk, right, verse 9 talked about the coming of the king, but the next two verses talk about what that king is going to do. He's going to end warfare. He's going to take away weapons and, and horses. He's going to proclaim peace. He's going to liberate God's people. Look at what the verses say. Verse, verse 10, Zechariah 9. I will remove the battle chariots from Israel and the war horses from Jerusalem. I will destroy all the weapons used in battle and your king will bring peace to the nations. His realm will stretch from sea to sea, from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. Now don't mess this next part. Because of the covenant I made with you, sealed with, what's it say? Blood. I will free your prisoners from death in a waterless dungeon. All these good things are going to happen. Freedom, harmony, peace. Because, tucked away in the middle of that little promise in Zechariah, says, because of the covenant I made with you, sealed with blood. That is incredibly significant, you guys. This meek... <laughs> Colt riding king is going to achieve all those things mentioned in Zechariah because blood is going to be spilled in love. The Jesus who's not above riding on a colt is also not above hanging on a cross. He's not above opening his veins for you and I. That's our king. And we see that reflected also. Did you notice what the people were saying, what the people were shouting? They're shouting this term, Hosanna. Do you know what the word Hosanna actually means? It actually translates as, God, save us. You think they realized what they were saying that day? I bet some of them maybe did, some of them didn't. Even when the people were, were saying, they, this is another quote, they said, blessed is he who comes in the name of of the Lord, and I love this. That's a quote, you guys, from Psalm 118. And you know when, when, it, when it was used? It was used when pilgrims, that's what they would say when they would enter the temple sanctuary. And you know what happened in the temple sanctuary? It's where the sacrifices were made, it's, it's where blood was spilled to atone for people's sins. Sacrifice is reflected in Jesus, of course, and what he's going to do on the cross. So Jesus, you guys, he's been journeying to Jerusalem a long time. And what does Jesus do when he gets there? When he arrives in the, the city of kings, the city is waiting for its king, right? He doesn't go to like their version of the White House. Okay, he doesn't do that. He, he doesn't start setting up meetings with leaders. He, he doesn't like give speeches and start to fire up the crowd. No, what does he do? He, he goes straight to the temple. That was his target all along, right? Like if Jesus had Google Maps, that would have been the destination. Not just Jerusalem, the temple. And what does he do? What does he do when he gets there? It says that he goes in, that he looks around at everything. He, he takes it all in. Now, can I be honest? Like, when I read it, it feels a little anticlimactic because then he just leaves. <laughs> he takes it all in, and then he goes kind of back to the bed and breakfast in Bethany. And so, so you know, we kind of have to wait and see what this means, but to give you, uh, you know, right, a tiny trailer of coming attractions, Jesus hones in on the temple, you guys, not because he's going to improve it, not because he's going to reform it. Do you know what he's going to do? He's going to replace it. He's going to supplant it. He is going to become in himself the place of 
sacrifice. He's going to be where atonement is made for sin. He himself is going to be the place where forgiveness is now found. Guys, where, where friendship with God can now be attained. It's not in the temple anymore. It's in the person of Jesus. It's in this king that just rode into Jerusalem. It's found in the person of Jesus. Jesus, you guys, is a king. He's a good, he's a perfect king. He embodies control. He embodies power. He embodies humility. And he embodies sacrifice. This is the leader, I think, that I just got to believe, you guys, that we all secretly long for. Especially this November. I'm writing in Jesus. I'm just going to be honest. (laughs) But I think there's something in our hearts like we recognize and we see this is a different kind of leader. This is a different kind of king. This is a king I could get behind. I think our hearts long for Jesus. I, uh, I'm probably going to embarrass myself a little bit here. And, and I, I wrestled this week, guys, for a long time on how to land this. Kind of, where, where am I going with this? And so I'm just going to tell you what I do from time to time. And, and if you think it's corny, that's okay. You know, you're not going to hurt my feelings. But when I think about Jesus as a king, and someday I'm going to meet him, it's inevitable. I often try to imagine what, what, what am I going to do in that moment? When I, try to, when I try to close my eyes, I try to use my imagination. Like, and what, what would it be like if Jesus was there in front of me? King Jesus, how do I react? And honestly, a hundred different scenarios can go through my head. But there's one scenario that I, I just, it, it keeps reoccurring in my mind and in my imagination. And honestly, when I think about a king with a crown, a king who's good and powerful and, and humble and put me first, you know, you know what it does? Almost every time, I get down on my knee. This is how I imagine it. He's a king. And whether you think it's corny or not, I would just challenge you and encourage you today to think of Jesus as your king. Because he's the king you need. He's the king this world needs. And just a hard fact for you guys, every single person is going to bow someday. And you're either going to bow because you chose to or because you're forced to. I've made my choice. I bend a knee to Jesus because I choose to, because he changed my life. Jesus is my king. And I pray and I hope that he's your king too. You know, so as we, as we close, you guys, I just want to say a, a prayer. You know, you know what the correct response is, the correct posture for us? is to give him praise. It's to give him adoration. To say to him, you are, you are the king. You deserve my gratitude, my thanks. You deserve my life. And so we're going to do that. I'm going to hand it over to Pastor Levi. And we'll have an opportunity to respond to this king through our praise. Heavenly Father, we recognize Jesus as the King of kings. To him be all glory, all power, all authority, all control, and he will never be removed from the throne. So we recognize that here today, and we give you glory, we give you praise. And Lord, as we gather as, as with one voice, Lord, we sing praises to you. I pray that you would find joy in it, in our songs as we sing from our hearts. Lord, we love you, and we are so grateful for the sacrifice Jesus provided for us. We pray this 
in his name, because in his name there is power. And all God's people said, amen.